the archaeology of architecture. Um, the idea for this talk actually came out of last year's preservation conference when uh, David Mather was giving the presentation on just sort of an overview of archaeology. And in that, he uh, talked about this project that had been done by Hamlin University, where the students in the Hamlin Heritage Program had gone out and done some excavation work at the site of the Methodist Church in St. Paul that had been burned on uh, December 26, 1925. It's actually thought that perhaps candles from the Christmas celebration had caused the fire. <laughs> During the course of that work, among the many, many artifacts that they found and foundations of the structure, they found these fragments of the stained glass windows, and including, um, as you see in the lower right, fragments still in their original keening, giving some sense of the pattern of the glass. But the other thing that David mentioned was that these little shards of glass were the only clues that we had to what color the glass was in the, in the stained windows of the church. The reason being, the only photos that existed were black and white. And that got me thinking, what are the other types of information that we as archaeologists regularly encounter during our work that would be of use and benefit to heritage preservationists when they're thinking about reconstructing structures or thinking about structures that used to be part of their uh, communities? So what I'd like to do today is uh, first just give you a little bit of an overview of what is archaeology for those of you that might not be familiar with um, our methods and practices. And then uh, talk about what can archaeology tell us about the buildings that were once part of our communities and then how can they inform our understanding and improve our interpretation of existing historic buildings uh, and also of course their occupants. So we'll start with the, uh, the dry definition. What is archaeology? Archaeology is a scientific study of the human past through the excavation and analysis of artifacts and other material remains that people have left behind. And our goal is to further our understanding of human history and to preserve that history for the present and the future uh, and for increasing our understanding of that. Now, what it is not is dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> Much to the disappointment of several small children that have come to visit my sites over the years, we are not about dinosaurs. And despite what popular culture might think and what we might think of ourselves, we are not the adventure hero, nor are we the pith-helmeted, jodhpur-wearing, tweed-sporting Egyptologist. Why not? <laughs> this is what we tend to look like in Minnesota. Uh, we are often seen across fields, on lake shores, and in the woods, digging uh, basically what you would think of as a post hole or uh, these square units. And we work uh, in all sorts of different field conditions. Uh, you can see from uh, summer to uh, winter up until the ground freezes. And in the lower right, you might think, well, that doesn't look too bad. That's all green and lush. But you'll notice that there are coolers and backpacks and things are hanging in the trees. That's because the rest of this is poison ivy. So we work in a, a wide variety of conditions. And you'll notice that there's an area of tomb or pyramid in <laughs> These are some of the tools of our trade. Uh, we, we do do the work that you think of with little brushes and trowels and dust pans. But we also use uh, larger excavation equipment like the backhoe on the right. And our scale of our excavations can vary from uh, what you might think of as little squares, typical of archaeology to large-scale projects like the lower right. Uh, this is a Native American site near New Ulm, and this is uh, the Hastings Bridge project that we did, the site of a saloon and a hotel. And in Minnesota, as David kind of mentioned there, we, we do do a lot of different types of work with a lot of different time periods, everything from Native American sites through uh, fairly much the modern era. So we have about 12,000 years of history that we're covering in our projects. And on the right here, that's a uh, 1930s coffee can from a uh, homestead on the Iron Range. And if you think about the fact that we are studying human history, and if you think about how much of our lives are lived out uh, in structures, the uh, structures are where we, where we live, where we work, where we worship, where we shop. Uh, obviously, archaeologists are going to be working primarily in proximity to structures. 
And often that is where structures were formerly. If you think about us out someplace looking for something that's no longer there. But we also work uh, next to structures in states of ruin and also uh, by standing structures. And the structures that we deal with can be as, as ephemeral as uh, the teepee ring in the upper left. Those are stones that once held the, uh, a teepee in place out on the plains. We can see that there's some additional ones in the background. Uh, to dug out homesteads, which we have uh, excavated several in southwest Minnesota. Uh, and those can be as much as just a depression, a very small depression in the woods uh, that marks where somebody uh, made their initial homestead claim. <coughs> to much more substantial uh, remains of structures. Uh, in the upper right there we have a gang saw base that once supported a two-story uh, sawing uh, complex at a mill in Stillwater. To, the, uh, to bridge abutments, like the abutment of the uh, 1867 Lindale Avenue Bridge. <coughs> so you can see that scale varies considerably, those types of structures that we are working with. We also can address whole neighborhoods and communities, uh, such as the Slab Alley neighborhood in Stillwater, where we had multiple lots with multiple remains of multiple structures. Uh, and you can see the very, those are our, uh, little dots are where our tests were located. So our work is often taking place in immediate proximity to structures. Uh, and often, we can see the foundations here of the uh, saloon and hotel that burned in Hastings. And we're often focusing on those areas around the structure because, especially if they're immediate to the foundation, they're often protected. And that's often where uh, artifacts have accumulated over time and haven't been disturbed by subsequent uh, development on those lots. But in the initial, and we're looking at artifacts primarily, but initially it was the foundations themselves that were the focus of much of the early archaeology uh, in Minnesota of what we would call the historical period, basically after uh, your American settlement. And their focus in this work was to basically peel off the side, kind of cast the artifacts aside, unless they're kind of cool, and look at where the buildings were located. And so you can see we had uh, Fort Ridgely, Fort Snelling. A lot of this work took place in the 30s and 50s, with the goal being to identify which building was which, how big it was, and what it was constructed of, so that we could do historic reconstruction work. And here's a, an excellent example of one of those reconstructions, the Northwest Fur Company fur poster <coughs> Pine, uh, near Pine City. In this case, uh, the archaeological location of the stockade and the interior buildings was identified archaeologically and then this, the building was actually reconstructed on the actual site of the archaeology site, of the historic site. A similar example is uh, at Grand Portage where the reconstruction of the uh, Grand Portage site uh, took place on the actual location of the site. And in this case, uh, the artifacts as well were used to inform the interpretation, like how would these buildings be, uh, what sort of displays would be in them, what sort of artifacts would be, be used for the interpretation. <coughs> More recently, we've done a sort of similar project uh, in Forestville, and hopefully you get a chance to visit <coughs> Forestville when you're down in this part of the state. There came about a need to uh, construct a new visitor center on the site and some staff offices. and. So there's sort of a two-fold process that took place here. One was there was a barn on the site called the Old Barn that we really didn't know that much about. Uh, and secondly, to use what that, that information about the barn to create a sympathetic design for the new visitor center that would fit into the historic district. So here's uh, the limited uh, photographic evidence that existed for the Old Barn. You can see uh, here's, it appears here, this is the uh, lean-to addition, a little bit of the roof line. This is actually the wagon barn, uh, which still stands when you're out the site. And here, here the barn appears again, just on the very right-hand edge of a, a photo, wagon barn, and just to kind of orient you, uh, this is the uh, me and store and house down here. So under uh, the direction of MHS, uh, they performed excavations on the site of the barn, and you'd see the focus uh, was to identify where it was located by finding the corners of the barn, identifying the addition, and then they also looked at how was the building constructed, and they found that you know it was a, it was a three bay barn, the central bay, where were those walls located, and the result was 
that, have, that work informed a reconstruction uh, <coughs> that also is now the, the visitor center. So you have this three bay barn with an addition on the site that was actually constructed using reused, uh, reclaimed barn lumber and timbers, and it fits on that property. It's not trying to necessarily be the old barn in, 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 in its entire sense, but if you, it doesn't, also doesn't stand out uh, from the historic district. We do a lot of that same sort of thing that they were doing back in the 30s and 50s in terms of finding, uh, finding building foundations, looking for those corners, because <coughs> it's often where our work starts because that's, that's how we know where we are. We can put ourselves on the map once we find those, those key points. So this is uh, the Orth Brewery site in Minneapolis. We went out, we found the corners of the, of the brewery, then we could match that up with historic maps and go from there. But in the process, we also find these little, these little bits that inform our understanding of the structure itself. For example, I have a little note there that we, there was some remnant interior wall plaster on one of the walls. So we, we start to learn about how the buildings were finished on the interior. And I, I should say that archaeologists have to know not just how buildings are built, but we have to be able to recognize all the little pieces once they're demolished and disassembled as well. The, um, and it's these little bits that I find the most interesting, these little informative things that, you know, it's not just about bricks and mortar. And one of these projects that we had, one of those little sort of eyes spy moments, was a family dugout that we excavated near New Ulm. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Daniel Dingler had homesteaded their property with a dugout initially, and then they built the uh, quintessential four square white uh, barn uh, home. But from about 1858 to 1865, they had a dugout. And when we uh, excavated the area around the dugout, we found all these little bits of hard clay. Uh, and those were actually the wattle and daub from the interior of their dugout. And we found that um, some of those fragments were still preserved, even though they'd been plowed around in a farm field uh, for a hundred years, that there was still whitewash preserved on some of those pieces. And there's this great quote, of course, being Minnesotans, we have to you know, make a nod to Laura Ingalls Wilder, but um, she makes a, a description of a, of a white Earth wash, the earth walls of a, a dugout. So uh, that was a, just a little clue as to what this dugout was like on the interior. And David mentioned in my introduction that we uh, did a National Register nomination for the Milford Mine Historic District. If you're not familiar with the Milford Mine, it's uh, the site of Minnesota's worst iron ore mining accident. Uh, in February of 1924, a local uh, a, a lake that was sort of over the underground mine broke into the mine and 41 miners were drowned. And uh, part of that, you know, if you, if you think about that site uh, and what's, what sort of archaeology was there, and we, we identified the remains of, you know, the foundations of all the structures in, in the community. But in what you would think of as a dark, uh, dreary mining sort of landscape, based particularly because we get black and white photos, we found that the buildings actually had red foundations. They were painted a sort of cheery red, yellow, yellow exterior walls. It's just these little clues. You see a little paint remnant here of the yellow upper portion of the wall and the red foundations. And then the showers inside the dry house, which is where uh, miners uh, change their clothes in the morning, take their showers at the end of the day, and, and change into their, their clothes to head home. The showers were painted yellow. And so we have these little, these little clues and glimpses that would help us if we were to restore that structure, if we wanted to interpret that structure, that we find uh, archaeologically. What I'd like to do during the remainder of my talk is kind of take you into two projects that we've done. Uh, first one is work next to a standing structure, and the second one will be where a structure was formally located. And kind of take you through the archaeological process and then what we learned as a result of that work. So the first one is uh, at Fort Ridgely, at Fort Ridgely out near uh, Morton, Minnesota. Actually, Fairfax, excuse me. Uh, out near Fairfax, Minnesota. Fort Ridgely was a military installation from 1853 to 1872, and this is the only known photograph of the site from 1865. It was constructed in uh, direct response to the Dakota treaties that uh, created the Minnesota Reser uh, River reservations, and it was meant to be sort of an outpost between uh, the reservation to the west and the settlements to the east. Just to kind of orient you, uh, here's New Ulm, 
Here's Fort Ridgely and the Lower Sioux and Upper Sioux agencies. So it's right along the Minnesota River Valley. The entire fort initially was to be constructed of stone. And then there became a problem. Uh, one, there wasn't really good stone out there to work with. And second, there weren't a lot of people on, in the uh, force that was stationed there that knew how to work with stone. So the major at, at, that was stationed there eventually wrote back to Washington and he said, in view of this fact, I would recommend to the department of this post be, that this post be built with logs for the following reasons. We have an abundance of timber close at hand. It is easily prepared and put up and every hand soldier can be advantageously employed when they are hired mechanics to superintend. The post by an energetic management would be completed next summer. Much of it could yet be done this fall, all the logs cut, hewn, and hauled on the grounds this winter. So in the end, only two of the buildings, the storehouse and the listed men's barracks, were built of stone. The rest of uh, the fort was constructed with timber. The commissary building, which was the one that we were looking at, uh, was finished during the winter of 1854 to 55. During the U.S. Dakota War, uh, Fort Ridgely came under attack twice, and both of these atta attacks were repelled, though many of the fort's buildings, primarily those of wood, uh, were significantly damaged. When the uh, fort was decommissioned, uh, after that period, the, it was purchased by a farmer, and he used the remaining portion of the commissary as a barn, which this quote dates to that period. And after, after that, uh, when, the, when the land was purchased by the state and became part of, eventually in the 1970s, became part of one of Minnesota historical site sites, uh, there came a period where they said, okay, well, let's do some reconstruction out here. And that work was undertaken by the CCC during the 1930s. And this was actually some of the very first historical archaeology to take place in the state. And their focus, though, was on these, again, on the foundations. Let's find the foundations, let's expose the foundations. And if you go to Fort Ridgely today, you'll see the exposed outlines of most of the structures. In the background here, you can see what's left of the commissary. Just in that one, one corner. So the, the commissary being the only building of which any uh, above ground portion remained, they decided to reconstruct the entirety of it. Uh, again, the CCC did this work in, in 1937. You can see the original portion of the building here, the Fort Ridgely Monument, and this, this is all uh, rebuilt work. They actually used quarried stone from the quarry where the stone was uh, originally quarried for the fort. So we have the building before reconstruction in 1933 and post reconstruction in 1945. In the uh, intervening years, the uh, foundation on the west side of the building had begun to uh, crack and to actually start to bow outwards. So you can see here's the crack here, and this portion, this portion of the wall is actually bowing. And so uh, the historic sites, NHS historic sites, uh, undertake, undertook a stabilization project. But because uh, this portion of the building where this crack had developed was the only original portion of the building, before they could uh, do that work, they had us come in and do some archaeology. So here's our archaeological plan of our excavations. These little boxes are each, these are one meters, about three feet by three feet. Here's the, the building, the sandy building. And so we opened up this area so that the engineers could take a look at the foundation of the building and find out uh, what was going on that was causing that crack. And one of the things that uh, archaeologists pay a lot of attention to is the layers in the soil. And this, was, this site is sort of a classic example of what we can see in the soil. So the bottom, these bottom three layers, that's the natural soil. That's the soil that was there at the time that the fort was constructed. And in the very top of that, we would find material from the fort's occupation. Above that, the stuff that looks really sort of messed up, that's, when, that's the 1930s reconstruction. We have photos around the building while they were you know, re, they're repointing the foundations, they were doing all this work. And so in that, we find, we find artifacts related to their reconstruction. <coughs> and then in the 1970s, when MHS purchased the property, they, they kind of smoothed out all the land around it. They brought in some clay and sort of leveled everything out, which was really fun to dig through. Um, and then on top of that is the modern topsoil, which has things like golf balls and stuff <laughs> from, the port, from the Port Ridgely Golf Course. So all these, all these layers tell the story of this site. And after we carefully excavated them, we got down to 
uh, the, and expose the foundation of the building. And you'll see here on the top, it's kind of apparent to any layperson what might be the problem here. We have these huge, nice, quarried limestone blocks that are lay on just a, some, some split limestone, and underneath that is this nice round field stone. So they started with field stone, and then they took a little bit of quarry stone, and then this massive building on, resting on top of it. And over time, what happened on this side of the structure is that the mortar leached out from between these stones. So the, the, the roof sheds all the rainwater on this side of the building. On the south side of the structure, which is not, you know, it's protected from the rain, it doesn't have the rain shed on that side, we can still see all the mortar between the stones. Here, it was, you, you would really have to dig between those stones to find any remnant of mortar. So over time, things had just sort of started to settle and shift and didn't have mortar to hold them in place. So um, I believe this last summer, they went back and now they're starting to do the reconstruction work uh, to basically just sort of stabilize the structure so this, that the crack does not continue to spread. Here's a drawing to kind of show in more detail what we see here in terms of the soil. So we have topsoil, 1970s, 1930s, fort occupation, and earlier. And over here, next to the foundation, we have the builder's trench. Archaeologists love builder's trenches. These are, what, when they're building a stone foundation, they, they dig a wide channel that's wide enough for the bottom of the foundation. And then the, it steps in from there and then they backfill this builder's trench when they're done with constructing the building. And what we hope as archaeologists is that somebody drops something in there, preferably something that's dateable, so that uh, if, if we did not know when the building was constructed, that's where we'd most likely find some clues as to its date. Now, in, in the case of Fort Ridgely, which is very well documented being a military installation, we know when, exactly when the building was completed. But that's, that's often where we can find information. If you don't know when a building was constructed in your community, we can look for clues usually right around the, the foundation. And here, here's that same, same view in a photograph. So you can see the natural soil, you can see that cut through the builder's trench, and you can see that it sort of has sort of a tiger stripe look to it. That's because as they're backfilling it, you get little shovelfuls of topsoil and, and, and subsoil kind of mixed together in that uh, builder's trench. And then you can see some mortar and stuff at the top. <coughs> We also found a couple other features that were directly related to how the commissary was constructed. One of these, you'd see the builder's trench running along the entire wall, but then we also found at the corners that the builder's trench bumped out and there was these post holes for a, a fairly large post. And what that was, was that post would have been right here, and that would have supported scaffolding so that they could build the gable end of the commissary. They wouldn't have needed that scaffolding along this wall. <coughs> on this wall, I would bet that there is probably another, definitely one at the other corner, and probably two or three more uh, post holes for the scaffolding along the side of the building. So that provided us some clues as to how the building itself was constructed, the sort of things that don't necessarily end up in uh, the historic records. And we did find some artifacts uh, from the fort's uh, period of occupation. We have a, a medicine <coughs> bottle next, uh, some pieces of smoking pipes, and some <coughs> pieces of a stoneware bottle. We also found this very interesting uh, flask. Uh, the uh, picture on the lower right are of an intact example from the internet, but the piece that we had, uh, we had several large fragments of this flask that uh, you can't quite see it perhaps from where you're sitting, but it has a, a <coughs> Indian figure with his little dog and he's uh, hunting a bird in a tree. And it's a flask that came from, uh, it was manufactured in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we did have some artifacts in our builder's trench. Uh, besides the uh, nails and sort of construction-related things, somebody did drop their pocket knife and, and in the trench next to the foundation. The uh, last uh, site I'd like to take you into is the Eastman residence, which is located in downtown Minneapolis on uh, Nicollet Island, right in, the, right in the heart of the Mississippi River right in the heart of downtown. And uh, this, this was, uh, this site was the proposed location at the time, proposed location of the DSL High School's athletic field, which has since been constructed. Historically though, this area was the location of several homes, uh, including the mansion of William Eastman. 
And if you don't know Eastman, he was a leading uh, Minneapolis entrepreneur, and together he and a business partner actually purchased Nicollet Island in 1865. And shortly thereafter, he built his home in the center of the island. This is the earliest, uh, actually it's about the time it was constructed, I mean, about 1867, 1865, in that, era, in that era is when he constructed his home. You can see it has, it's basically a square, square structure with a little distinctive cupola in the middle. This is Hennepin Avenue, this is the original Hennepin Avenue suspension bridge, and this is uh, this railroad line still runs across the island. So St. Anthony Main over here. <coughs> we have very few <coughs> images of the Eastman home. Uh, this one from 1874 is one of the best. This is actually an illustration uh, from around the border of a, a map of Minneapolis. So we have this, we have this one from 1874. And it's kind of uh, amazing that we don't have more representation. We have one more and I'll show you in a minute. Because the house itself is described as the most elaborately decorated and expensive home in Minneapolis. And we do have just two newspaper, we have two newspaper accounts of remodeling, which was undertaken in 1881 by architect Lee Ruth Buffington, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. And we have a single paragraph description of the house and its layout from Minneapolis Illustrated. When Eastman passed away in 1902, he left the house to his family, uh, but his son, uh, his grandson, by 1919, had moved off island. And the home was unoccupied for about a dozen years before it was eventually destroyed by arson fire on October 1st, 1926. But this, this illustration from 1889 shows what the home became after that work that Leroy Buffington did in 1881. Uh, most notably, he added this substantial tower to this side of the building. So here's the original home. Mm -hmm. Added this tower, he added a rear wing off the back, kitchen wing, and some additions here as well. So definitely a uh, major change to the structure. Excuse me, Michelle, mm -hmm. was it Buffington the original architect of this well? We do not know who the original architect was. We do know that he did the remodel. I, don't, I think it might be a little early for Buffington, but I don't, I'm not sure when, what the initial home. So the, the location of the house, we, we knew to be in what was then the center of the De La Salle practice field. Uh, and we, this, this map that you're looking at here is a, a Sanborn fire insurance map, a, another uh, excellent historical resource where they went around and uh, documented for fire insurance purposes what structures were built of, how many stories they were, what sort of fire suppression systems they might have. So uh, just to go into that a little bit here, because it's interesting, uh, we have a dwelling, B for dwelling, two and a half stories, three stories for the tower, and you can see the uh, kitchen addition coming off the back. Uh, and these, this indicates the, the first story porch. You can see a side-by-side -side dwelling. So you can see that there's this large estate uh, acreage here for the Eastman Mansion, and that first view that we saw of the house from 1874 is looking at it from this direction. Our field work began with a series of trenches, uh, just to see if, you know what the soils, what the soil horizons looked like, and whether there was anything there uh, that had survived. And we found that uh, within the trenches, on the foundations of the home, and also artifacts associated with the residence. And and I should say that uh, you made a notice. We keep talking about all these stone foundations. At, at, in, at that period in time, if you, if you demolished a structure, you didn't spend a lot of time chasing after those stone foundations and digging them out of the ground. If you think about what we did to the World Trade Center site, we took that and cleaned that down to bedrock. There's not one remnant of that building left. And we do that now with almost all of our modern construction. But at that time, it was much easier to just sort of level things out, bring in some fill, and start building again from that point up. So archaeologically, we almost always find the remains of the structures from this period, unless something more substantial had come in and been built on top of that, that lot. Uh, in this case, since all that <coughs> ever happened since the building was taken down since construction of the athletic field, the remains of the house were still there. And you can see the layers, um, it's about three to four feet down to the foundations of the house. And over time, they, they brought in uh, various loads of topsoil to try to build up the athletic field. And then there was a nice peat mix and uh, a uh, What's the word? Yeah, I can't think of the word for it. But anyhow, we, they had these uh, several layers on top of the site. And even during our initial uh, investigations, we learned something about the 
Eastman Mansion that was completely unknown previously. <coughs> and that was that the 40 room red brick mansion was actually not constructed of red brick at all, but was actually painted. It was a yellow brick structure that had been painted red. Mm. Um, so we had all these uh, bricks with red painted faces. Mm. And this is the back of that same brick Ooh. showing that it's actually a yellow brick. I think uh, Eastman was from New Hampshire. I think there was sort of this New England sensibility that a brick house should be red. And so we painted it red. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because we found that the site was intact, because it was associated with Eastman, who was such a significant and important individual in the history of Minneapolis, uh, the site went on to a date of recovery. And this is the, uh, looking at the back of the house, this is the kitchen addition. You see the outline of that. You see the, the joists, the remnants of where the joists were 16 inches on center, just as you would still construct your house today. Uh, and you can see the various outlines of the structure. This what was, was this? <coughs> what year were you doing this? Uh, that was uh, 2008. This is the uh, resulting map of our investigations. The northern portion of the house up in here, this would be like where the tower was, and uh, this area had been just completely uh, demolished down to bedrock. We even had these little, these little stars up here from where the steam shovel had tried to grab actually a foundation as they demolished the home. But the rest of it was very well preserved. You can see the outline uh, of the original house. So this is the 1867 portion, the original portion of the house with its central, this is where the central hallway was located. Uh, parlor uh, off to one side, reception off to the other. We're actually looking at the crawl space below the main floor of the house. So we have the remains of the boiler and the heating system. It had a steam heating plant. And then we also had the outlines of uh, Buffington's 1881 edition. This would be in the corner of the tower, this connecting edition, and then the kitchen L off the back. And in pockets in there, in, there was, there was pockets of preserved material, uh, especially if you get in this area where the coal room was, a net, and against foundations where the demolition debris had sort of been caught. Uh, so we had like, this is the, the door to the boiler. Uh, so we a lot of a lot of artifacts from the Eastmans were preserved on the site. Here you can see some examples uh, of plate shattered in, in place on the in, on, in the uh, house remains. Intact bottles still. This is the uh, boiler, and this is the kitchen hearth in, in the inside of the kitchen. But it was these again these little details that I found. Particularly interesting because remember we didn't we didn't know a lot about how was this house of the significant individual appointed on the inside, uh, and we found in the area of that uh, 1881 addition in the base of the tower, we found a lot of art tile, <coughs> and this art tile was made in uh, Chelsea, Massachusetts by J and J G Lowe Art Tile Works, and this is uh, some fragments of the tiles that we recovered, and this is the catalog example of the illustration of this tile from the catalog. <coughs> we also found a wide variety of different types of marbles. This is just a sample of some of the different marbles and they also had different profiles. Uh, and we know that at least the main hall was wainscotted and um, had a marble floor. So we, we know that it, it, it just speaks again to what this house was like on the interior. And of course, they had their stained glass. This is just a small example. I wanted to show you some of the variety of colors and textures of the stained glass. And this was, we found this pretty much universally across the site. So there was probably stained glass in the original building and also in the addition. So this is probably my favorite pieces. These were plaster moldings uh, that we found uh, intact examples of. They came out sort of as these wet, gooey things, and, and we let them dry, and then you could see that we had um, moldings of wheat mm -hmm. and corn. <coughs> and these were uh, found in the area of the front hall, which is the original main entrance into the building, uh, the, eight, the 1867 house. We don't know if they were added as part of the remodeling or if they were part of the original structure, but I like to think that uh, they were, you know, here you have this 
this uh, individual whose prominence is based in Mill. Uh, and if you came into the front hall of this building, you have these symbols of corn and wheat uh, in the ceiling plasters at, at, at the reception hall. So this would be that entrance. This is that, the, the main entrance in that, in that area inside the building. So this has been sort of a brief uh, overview of what archaeologists do and the types of uh, work we do around structures and within structures and the, and the information that we can garner. And I hope that it will uh, help you consider how archaeology might inform future architectural restorations in your communities and also what sort of information uh, can be used to augment the interpretation of storage structures, not just artifacts, but the actual little bits that we can learn about the structures themselves. <laughs>